So welcome to the fourth wall exhibit. Here we are in the rotunda of City Hall and uh, we're going to do a really short lightning round version of the entire exhibit. So we've got two metaphors here. One is the fourth wall. The fourth wall is the uh, virtual imaginary wall between the audience and a stage in theater. And it's an important thing in theater because it creates two separate realities. The actors who don't interact with the audience and the audience who watch the actors but in a passive way without interacting with them which is good for theater, really bad for politics. We want the citizens and the politicians talking back and forth to each other in a uh, two-way dialogue. Number two, check this out. This is the uh, city hall, the two towers. You've got two towers facing each other, and the designer, for some reason, thought it was appropriate to have no windows facing the public whatsoever. All the staff are essentially looking at each other, talking back and forth to themselves. That's the fourth wall. How do we break the fourth wall? How do we create a situation where the public is looking in and politicians are proactively looking out and seeking input? I'll tell you how we can do it. We have 30, I'm just shooting a video. Oh. It's okay. Oh yeah, it was always, we were watching it. Okay. <laughs> how did today go? Yeah? Good luck with your endeavor and take care. Okay, too. You're gonna just, you're gonna just like edit that? Sure. Okay, so. How do we create that culture of political engagement, a two-way dialogue? We have 36 short proposals that tell us how we can do that. Follow me. This panel is called Reaching Out. It's about how we uh, let people know that stuff is happening in their neighborhoods and how we encourage their input. Right now we do it terribly. This is a notice of application. This is what we put in newspapers to alert people to, about developments in their neighborhood. No one's ever going to notice these. No one's going to read them. No one's going to know how they can be involved. We asked designers how they would redesign public notices so that they would be exciting, they would catch your attention, let you know where it's happening, what's happening, and how you can get involved. And the good news here is that in the village of Pemberton, they've actually taken our recommendations, completely redesigned their official notice based on the proposals in the fourth wall. And I flew out to uh, Pemberton a few months ago and I gave the Dazzling Notice Award to the mayor of Pemberton. They're the leaders now, the municipal leaders in Canada of creating engaging public notices. Who's gonna win the award in 2013? We'll find out. Spending our money. This is about the municipal budget process. How can we get more citizens engaged with how we spend their money and maybe get their input, maybe even in a binding vote New York and Chicago have been adopting participatory budgets where part of the annual spending is broken down by ward and people can get together in meetings that look kind of like this and they learn about how the budget process works and then they literally get a ballot and decide how money is spent in their neighborhoods. It's educational, informative, and it brings people into the decision-making process. Calgary has an iPhone app that actually allows people to learn about the budget right on the streetcar or the bus. It's a free downloadable app, right? Why don't we have that? I don't know. Let's get one. The uh, education system, the next generation, are we giving kids the tools they need to learn how to engage as citizens when they're older? Uh, the answer is no. We do a little bit of civics in grade five, and then we do a half course in grade 10 that tries to cover municipal, provincial, and federal, which is impossible. American history, full course. Canadian civics, half course. That's weird. Calgary has a city hall school where classes literally spend an entire week at city hall in a classroom with city staff from 10 different departments, meeting counselors, meeting the mayor. They learn how the system works. They're more likely to be involved when they're older than students in Ontario who aren't exposed to the process. It would be like getting a piece of furniture from Ikea without the instructions. You wouldn't be able to put it together. People need the manual to engage. Okay, moving along. Uh, this one's a little more philosophical. Uh, if we want to uh, get citizens to, to see themselves having a higher uh, level of power, we also need to bring politicians down, perhaps, off of the pedestal we put them on. So we're looking at two things here. One is, why do we still use the word worship? Can you zoom in on that? Worship. That's how we describe the mayor. That's a word that goes back to a time when we didn't have a role, we didn't have input. This is going to get difficult now because the Zamboni is coming out. Um, we want to be in a political culture where the politicians are seen as temporary servants and the voters are supreme. And Mayor Ford actually talks about that a lot. The voters are supreme. If that's the case, 
why are we referring to our mayor as his or her worship? Let's move on, right? That's archaic. What are we naming things after? When we name landmarks and parks and buildings after people, we're recognizing their efforts. We're also creating role models. If all of our role models are just politicians and rich people, then most people don't have role models to aspire to because most of us will never be elected nor wealthy. There's lots of community leaders who have done a lot of city building leadership but aren't elected and aren't wealthy. We name little alleyways and parkettes after them and we name everything else after the wealthy and the elected. And I think this should be a more level uh, balance. These are all to scale, by the way. A lot of research went into this. It's all perfectly to scale. Um, this is looking at two things in terms of how citizens can organize in their neighborhoods. One is uh, neighborhood groups, neighborhood associations, residence groups. In Toronto, they're very disorganized, very, um, what's the word? Um, not cluttered, there's a word, scattered. Uh, a lot of neighborhoods don't have residence groups. Those that do, they come and they go. Some don't have websites, some don't have regular meetings. Uh, there's no map or list that actually tells people if they have a resident group. Other cities like LA, LA for example, has 90 elected neighborhood councils. It's structured, it's regulated by the state, and they have staff support. This is a real sign, I didn't Photoshop this. The Department of Neighborhood Empowerment from Los Angeles. City staff dedicated to supporting 90 elected neighborhood councils. In Toronto, we have four staff who are dedicated to supporting business associations and no staff who are committed to supporting residence associations. So that's one proposal. Uh, we also used to have a great group in Toronto called the Bureau of Municipal Research, and they provided citizens with evidence-based, nonpartisan information about municipal affairs. We don't really have anything like that now, and I think it's lacking in the city, and it would be helpful because right now things are very polarized at City Hall. Moving right along, this is about a project called Rabbit, the Ranked Ballot Initiative of Toronto. Runoff voting is a really small and simple change that would make our elections in Toronto more fair and friendly. It eliminates strategic voting, eliminates vote splitting, allows more voices at the table. It prevents um, lower profile candidates from being pushed out, who are often women, youth, or visible minorities. It also means that you end up with a candidate that most people actually like, which is pretty important in an election. The website for this is uh, rabbit.ca, right there, 1B, rabbit.ca, check it out, it's amazing. And one good thing about this is that we have attracted multi-partisan support from the right and the left wing of council and the middle. It's not a politicized idea, it's just a good idea to make democracy better. Okay, we're almost halfway through the exhibit. This is uh, called uh, Choosing When We Choose. It's about the timing of elections. So the first question is, why do we have elections on a weekday? If you're a, an event planner, one of the basic rules of planning events is if you want to maximize public participation, hold it on a weekend. That's why the organizers of Taste of the Danforth, Doors Open, the Indy, Carabana, Pride, Nuit Blanche, Santa Claus Parade, Toronto Outdoor Art Exhibition, Cavalcade of Lights are all on the weekends. This here is a list of every major city event we hold on weekdays. There is one. It's the election. For the same reason you would never hold a Santa Claus parade on a Wednesday, why do we hold our elections on a Monday? People are busy, they have jobs, after their job they got to pick up their kids, then they got to go home. When are they voting, right? This one is fascinating. This is looking at the length of election terms. So we used to have elections every year in the history of Toronto. Uh, for most of the history of Toronto, all the way back to 1834 up to the 50s, 10 elections per decade. When they wanted to change it, they asked citizens in a referendum, 100 years ago, 1912, should we extend the term of city council from one year to two? Most residents said no. And it was respected back then. The citizens are the ones who should make the choice. They're the bosses, they're supreme. So they had another referendum and another and another and another and another and another and another. Eight referenda over a 40 year period until in the 1950s, voters said fine, change it to a two year term. In, 19, in uh, 2006, the opposite thing happened. They wanted to change the term from three years to four years. David Miller asked Dalton McGinty. McGinty said, sure, no problem, done. That's the fourth wall, right? I'm the politician, there's a wall. I'm not gonna ask you, I'm not gonna tell you, I'm not gonna inform you. I'm gonna talk to the other actors on the stage. What a huge cultural shift that from 100 years ago, we went from a process of eight referenda over 40 years to one handshake in the back room. We need to recreate a political culture where we understand that citizens have a voice, 
they, they, it's mandatory to consult with them and their opinion should be binding. That's one of our recommendations in the proposal. Why don't we take a quick break and look at this. This is the voting wall where we summarize the 36 recommendations. So for example, we just looked at legislation should be created imposing a binding referendum on future term extensions. It should never be done behind closed doors. 36 proposals, red ones are provincial, blue ones are municipal, and people are voting over here with these cute little stickers telling us which ones they like the best. Okay, we're halfway. How are we doing? Does this thing just keep going and going? It's like it just tapes and tapes. Okay, our election. So here's some flaws we have in our current election system. Number one, the election website uh, is using technology that's at least 10 or 15 years out of date. So, for example, you can't type in your ward, your address, and find out which ward you live in on the election website. And most people don't know their ward number. Once you do know your ward, you're given a list of candidates. You click on each one and it opens up separate windows. Most of those windows, as you can see here, don't list any information about the candidates because candidates aren't able to update their candidate information online. You have to fill out a paper form, which they don't know about, sign it and bring it in. They can update their finances online, but not their information. Then, even if you're someone like Mohammed Danani, who figures out how to get your information on the website, if you look right here, you'll see <coughs> email, web, fantastic. They refuse to hyperlink it. The city won't actually create a link that you can click on. It's some kind of huge breach of privacy and security to have a hyperlink URL on a city website. Um, we also don't promote the nomination process at all. So nominations start in January of an election year, and we don't announce it. No one knows it's happening. We don't put up billboards, no radio ads, no news. There's one newspaper ad that's designed like the one we saw before, one that no one will ever look at. Um, what I point out here is that if a company, a private company in the private sector, had 67 senior positions available, imagine how much effort and resources they would spend in headhunters and advertisements and newspapers to get a really good crop of candidates. We do nothing, which might explain why we end up with what we end up with. Okay. Making meetings meaningful. There's no point in having open public meetings if they're not designed in a way that's engaging and democratic and fair. So a few quick things here. This one's called last minute motions. There's no point in having clerks and agendas uh, if we're gonna ignore them, right? So if people are gonna move a motion to let's say rip out a bike lane, put it on the agenda. Have the guts to have a debate and invite people to make deputations. The Jarvis bike lane, it was proposed to rip it out at a meeting where it wasn't on the agenda and everyone from the public had already spoken at the meeting. Totally unfair. Um, overnight meetings where you have to be there at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. to speak, that's not very democratic. Some people have children, they should probably be at home with their kids. Um, having childcare meetings, serving food, those are all things we can do to help get more people involved. Uh, this is called Break It Down. It's about how we can break down the city into smaller segments. We amalgamated about 15 years ago. No one wanted to, uh, but we're not going to de-amalgamate. So how do we mitigate the negative consequences of amalgamation? One of the reasons that Etobicoke, North York, Scarborough, York, and East York didn't want to amalgamate is because they didn't want to have their city hall shut down and have to come all the way down to Bay and Queen for their city hall. That's okay. We can fix it. New York City and Montreal are both very large cities, geographically and population-wise. Without de-amalgamating, they've created a secondary lower tier of democracy. They're called community boards in New York, and they're called boroughs in Montreal. And local decision-making has been delegated down to them. They're much smaller than Toronto's community councils. They've been delegated more authority. And what it does is it, it, it corrects the mistakes of the past. We've actually shut down 19 city halls in the history of Toronto. They're all listed right here. People know about the North Yorks and the Scarborough and the Etobicokes, but Long Branch, Weston, Parkdale, Brockton, Yorkville, Mimico, these had city halls, mayors, councils, and you could go to those city halls to get involved. They're all shut down. How do we give that decision-making power back to neighborhoods? This is the last panel. It's called Upgrading the Clamshell. The Clamshell is the name we use for this building, City Hall. We're in City Hall, by the way. Welcome. Uh, so first of all, public Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is a great way to get people interacting with their friends. Um, it's also a great way to be engaged. If you're here in this building, wouldn't it be great if you could download a staff report, right? Or email your counselor. 
uh, Wi-Fi has been around since 1994 in terms of public institutions. We have a timeline here of public institutions who have implemented Wi-Fi. The blue ones are actual city halls. 2005, almost 10 years ago, Albany put Wi-Fi in their city hall. Carnegie Mellon University, 1994. Why can't we do it here? We now have a semi-open Wi-Fi as of about four months ago. It's really hard to access. Um, they almost make it as hard as possible to ensure that you're not going to use it. Um, lastly, the rotunda, the lobby itself. They used to produce really useful booklets about how to be involved with local politics. They stopped publishing these about six years ago. Now all they publish here is uh, tourist flyers. Um, and they, whenever someone's trying to make a really good video about participation, they run Zambonis. Get a shot at the Zamboni. <laughs> They're constantly trying to sabotage the efforts of people like myself who are trying to make this place more open and accessible. <laughs> so what, we have 144 leaflets and flyers at Toronto City Hall. Every one of them is for a tourist attraction. I've produced a bunch of flyers, imaginary flyers, of what I think we should have. What's a community council? When's the next meeting? What's a deputation? How do I run for office? What's a standing committee? If you don't know these things, you can't be involved. It's that thing about the IKEA um, manual, right? Now the argument we get in response to this is, well, this stuff's all online now. We don't need to print it, it's online. Well, guess what? African Lion Safari has a website too, but they're smart enough to know that marketing, it's not enough to have a website, you've got to bring people to it. You have to print things on paper in color and put it in front of people's faces. That's marketing. We have to remind ourselves how to do that. So there's 36 recommendations. You can Find out more on the website, thefourthwall.ca. Send us your feedback, and thanks for listening. Thank you. That was amazing. I can't believe that I.